Good afternoon everyone. My name is Leanne Wyville from Impact Innovation Group. We're working with the Queensland Government to present a series of webinars for Queensland Small Business Week. And today's webinar with John Matthew talks about the crowdfunding process. Now just while we're waiting for everybody else to arrive, I am going to go through some of the tools that we have in the GoToWebinar Citrix system so that uh, you can take part in some of the interactive opportunities that will be provided. Now at the moment your screen should uh, look something like this where you have a slide and you have your own control panel. And with that control panel, you can participate in a couple of things that's happening, but this is the main thing you should be seeing now. If you don't have a control panel that you can see, maybe you've just got this little red button, one way to make sure that your control panel always stays open is to click on view up in the top menu and uh, uncheck auto hide. A couple of the interactive tools, John might ask you to raise your hand. So in uh, on the control panel on the left hand side you'll see this little button with um, a hand and let's just do a little test now. Please raise your hand if you can see that hand button because that also tells me that the audio is working. Great, so everybody now knows how to use the hand button. That's just for raising hands. If you actually have a question, what we'd like you to do is to type it into this box. You'll find that lower down on your control panel. Uh, so type in your questions as they occur to you. John will be answering questions at the end of the webinar, but if they occur to you, just put them in there at any time. You can also use this box to let us know if um, if the screen freezes or if you're having trouble with audio and we may be able to fix that from our end. But that's the main communication box to use with us. Also, I recommend that you download the two handouts that are available today. One is a copy of John's slides from his presentation today. He's kindly agreed for those to be shared. And another is uh, a list of various webinars we've been holding this week. Um, we've already run two webinars, so if you've missed them you should be able to find them on the Impact Innovation Group YouTube channel. Uh, uh, and uh, there's a list of the other webinars for the rest of the week. So download those handouts. I suggest you try and do that now so that you have them available to you because once the webinar's finished you won't be able to access those handouts. Now John may run a poll today. So something to look for in your control panel it's the word poll and you'll be asked a simple question and the opportunity to choose uh, one of the answers and I think it'll probably be yes, no and then we'll see the results of that poll. So just keep an eye out for poll in your control panel. So in a moment I'm going to hand over to John. And just to give you some of John's background, John is an entrepreneur and University of Queensland doctoral candidate. His biomedical research and pharmacology background has prompted a keen interest in how Australia's biotech sector could accelerate growth. And uh, his thesis has been understanding and analysing the process of crowdfunding and applying its potential in Australia. And while conducting his research, John worked with a number of uh, executives with Brisbane companies to create refine and run crowdfunding campaigns. And his approach to crowdfunding has created tangible value for Australian companies at all stages of the, of the commercialisation process. And prior to his postgrad studies and prior to joining Impact Innovation Group, John worked in public health uh, in um, technology roles and administrative roles and has helped to build unique experiences in patient care, hospital administration, clinical data management administrative protocols and various pathways for medical devices and technologies to be commercialised. So I'm just going to hand over to John. I believe his webcam isn't working today but that's not a problem because you're all able to listen and see the slides. So I'm going to hand over now. Welcome to the webinar John.
Thank you so much, Leanne, and uh, thank everybody for tuning in today. I hope your Queensland Small Business Week is going well. Um, so today I'll be touching on a couple of points and building upon my previous talk on uh, the do's and don'ts of crowdfunding by kind of touching on the crowdfunding process that has kind of worked for me and um, what I'll be pulling on uh, my research as well as my understanding of the literature and more importantly pointing out the key issues associated with uh, executing crowdfunding and kind of demystifying the whole process. So the idea of crowdfunding first and foremost has been kind of hyped is the best way to put it in media. Um, the idea that you can simply post your idea or your product or your technology or service online and have well-meaning and well-supporting uh, uh, well um, individuals basically giving you money to um, just essentially make the product is, is always an idea that doesn't always calculate or translate well. Um, so uh, I have based my entire research on trying to understand this process and kind of um, standardizing it to an, a way in which most companies within the Australian context, it should be said, could apply this to their, um, their ideas, their IP, their technology that could actually help um, make crowdfunding kind of a viable funding model for people. Now I love this slide because um, it kind of first and foremost demystifies it from the get-go. Um, we've been doing crowdfunding for centuries. Uh, Alexander Pope um, originally crowdfunded to translate um, Aristotle's um, teachings from ancient Greek culture. We've had Mozart crowdfund his, um, his concerts uh, when he was younger. We've had um, the crowdfunding for um, the Statue of Liberty um, to, to show um, unity between France and the US. And now in 2016 we're now crowdfunding lovely dog collars that actually help you track your little friend while they're at home and in the dog park. So it's nothing new, um, it's just a matter of getting the process right to deliver on something that's consistently and reliably um, producing results in terms of funding. So why did I look at crowdfunding? Well, first and foremost, it has crowdfunding, it has funding in the name. But the more I looked into it, the more I understood that it actually encourages entrepreneurial thinking. And it actually really synergizes with the way in which entrepreneurs and innovative companies think where they talk directly to their consumers and thus create products, services and um, uh, business models based on their demand. So it's essentially supply and demand then and there. So this is uh, what people don't realize is, is the commercialization process in its entirety at the start. But it also allows entrepreneurs to kind of diversify their own capabilities and forces a different type of communication. Scientists and angel investors talk way different to, to, differently to each other, but you need to be able to communicate to them both. They talk differently to grant and government bodies, different to consumers, different to wholesalers and investors. So this idea of communication and the advancement of communication is pivotal to understanding how crowdfunding works. So, just to give you an idea, um, the current models that exist within crowdfunding now um, are the donation model, the reward-based crowdfunding model, or the pre-purchase model, um, the lending model, and the equity model. Now, these are the I say this that these are the current models because this is still a dynamic um, industry. So um, these models are liable to evolve, to change, or be um, engulfed by something better and much more advanced, or much more much more applicable to the current market. So um, just to give you a slight tangent, um, after the release of the budget, um, the Australian government has now allowed equity crowdfunding to be utilized on a kind of a small level, but it's the first step in the right direction. So the focus of my research uh, has been around donation and reward-based crowdfunding, just because they're the biggest markets and the highly and most widely utilized. Um, now, just as a show of hands, and I do apologize, I only have to show my control panel. Um, just as a show of hands, if you can raise your hand if you either donated or um, uh, or either donated or have run a crowdfunding campaign. One, two, three. Actually, um, John, we 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 had a poll set up for that. Oh yes, my mistake. Oh yeah, if we can do the poll. That'd be great. Yeah, so people are very interesting results coming through. 
Yes, wow. Uh, those results shortly. Excellent. Well, we've got a really split room. That's it awesome. Looks like, yeah, so I'll just uh, flick that on the screen now. Excellent. Very cool. Okay, so I'm not talking to um, people who are alien and alien to crowdfunding. That's awesome. Okay, so this will make a lot of sense to you. And those in the room that haven't um, experienced crowdfunding, I'll also be um, taking you through the basics as well. So I'll try and hit both um, both groups equally as best I can. That's really cool. Um, all right. So the first thing and the first piece of advice I can give you is look before you leap. Um, a lot of people jump into crowdfunding with the assumption that uh, it is a, a a guaranteed thing, that lots of people do it. The success, the success stories um, say that all I have to do is post my idea online and I will get money. It's a very high risk, high, high failure um, uh, mode of funding. And the reason why it's high failure is because a lot of people don't understand the process before getting involved in it. Um, now, it's high risks to both the campaign owner and the investor giving their money. So the campaign owner has a lot more risks involved. So that's why people tend to be a bit jaded after they come out the other end of crowdfunding and say, well, it was, it was a complete waste of time. No one appreciated it. Um, they, they didn't understand what I was going for. And that's, and that's fair enough. And that may be because you didn't um, consider the risks before jumping in. So first of all, it's an intellectual property risk. Um, you are essentially posting your IP online. And it is worthwhile to ensure that if you are sharing it, it is protected. And what you are sharing won't allow your product, service, idea to get sniped. Um, it is an online platform and a public forum. Um, also, the idea of reward-based crowdfunding is important to touch on because as part of reward-based crowdfunding, whether or not you either give or offer a pre-purchase model of your product, um, you need to deliver on your promises of if you give me money, I will give you this product. Um, and that, if you do not do that, that directly impacts on your branding and your um, the trust and reputation because you're essentially going to be branding yourselves on this crowdfunding campaign. Um, and more importantly, people jump into crowdfunding because they think this is their last ditch effort, the Hail Mary pass. And sometimes it is, but more often than not, the ones that, are, that succeed are the ones that don't necessarily need need the money or going to fail without the money. They're the people who will need the money but have other avenues to kind of supplement that. Um, it's also a high risk to the investor because they're giving their, um, their donation, their um, investment, and they may not get a product out of it because of the high risk, high, fail, high failure rate. Um, there may be initial changes to the product offerings, like, oh, we were thinking of making this product because this, but over the course of the campaign, we found out that it wasn't sustainable, so we're changing what you will get. That has happened, and people have had a huge backlash because of it. And as a result from that, it's increased lead time. Well, we promised to give it to you in six months, and two and a half years later, we're still waiting on the product. So all of this needs to be taken into consideration before jumping into crowdfunding if this is what you want to do. Now, this is the um, kind of the, the thought line that uh, I developed to kind of basically break down the crowdfunding process, what questions need to be asked at what stages to best build the campaign that we want to ensure the result we want. So first and foremost, we're looking at the focus here. How much do I need? Uh, what's my target market? What's my target donator likely to give me? Because a lot of people don't realize the initial people to actually support you are the people that you're looking to sell to already anyway. So if you've got um, a crowdfunding, a cup that um, is collapsible, let's say, um, what is your target market? Well, people who are coffee drinkers, people who drink, co um, uh, who use cups. Realistically reviewing how much these people are likely to spend on a cup and therefore how much they're likely to donate to a cup-based crowdfunding campaign really needs to, needs to take into consideration because that will determine your ultimate funding goal. And if you're asking for half a million dollars for a cup for people who spend maximum on two to three dollars a cup, you slowly begin to realize it's not a sustainable idea that 
maybe I shouldn't be asking for half a million dollars, maybe 10,000 is much more of a obtainable goal. Next, you're looking at your crowd. So it comes back to, okay, so I've got this idea, what, who is gonna be in my crowd? How much, um, how much does my crowd have? Um, what does my crowd think is important? Um, how does my crowd communicate? How do I talk to them? Is my crowd made up of intellectuals? Are they property investors? Are they uh, moms and dads? Are they kids? Um, all of this needs to be consideration because in the next stage is, is your channels, applying that communications tactic to different social media, different printed media, different traditional radio or TV. Um, all of these different ways in which you communicate with this crowd will then build upon your idea of the core message originally developed in your focus. Next, then you have to move on to your platform. Now, this is separate to your communications, where your platform de determines which crowdfunding campaign platform am I going to be using? Um, am I going to be utilizing it as a tech base? Am I going to be focusing more on a uh, non-profit emotional donation base? Um, is it an equity based? Um, what angle am, are my platforms going to impact on my story? Now, lastly is your launch. Um, are you ready to launch? Um, has your crowd grown enough to reach the target that you want? Are you able to manage the influxations, the amount of demand? Um, if you're doing a, crowd, a reward based crowdfunding and you one of your reward tiers um, gets filled up, are you going to have stretch goals? Are you going to cancel that out completely? Um, if you cancel that out completely, will that impact your ability to actually obtain your funding goal? All of these things need to be considered. And finally, your result, when you actually get your money or don't get your money, what do I do now? It's a, lot, it's a big question. Well, I've got this all this money now. Um, do I have commitments to uphold? Do I have rewards to give out? Do I have pre-purchases to give out? Do I have to pay tax on this? And that's an interesting question. And the, quest, the, the answer is yes and no. It's important to talk to a tax consultant for this. But uh, I want to draw your attention to the timeline here. This, this process, typically, in my experience and the experience in literature, is three to four months. That's three to four months of reviewing, analyzing, building, strategizing, executing, and implementing before you even hit the word go. So that needs to be taken into consideration. So this will all be in the hand. I won't spend too much on this, but it's essentially... Who has your back? So the original idea of crowdfunding is you went to a select group of people that you know and trusted um, to give you money because they knew and trust you. Um, they're the people who believed in you. So they're the friends, your family, and unfortunately the fools um, who, who essentially supported the idea because they believed in you. Now you have to kind of translate that to grow your crowd. So how do you package your core message, your core idea, your core strategy, your core service or product to make it more attractive to people who do not know you? Um, so how do you sell your idea? Now, it's important to know that size does matter, but not as much as how you use it. Um, the engagement of the crowd that you build is as important as the, crowd, the size of the crowd itself. If you have a really big crowd with lots of different diversified markets and professionals, and they're not doing anything for you, they're not sharing your product, they're not talking about your idea, they're not talking about your campaign, they're not giving you money, they're essentially dead weight. And it's, a, it's the strategy of knowing how to engage with those that crowd, which is really important. Now, it's important to know that every crowd is different. And, that's, that, and therefore, every campaign is different. And every strategy has to be tweaked in order to deliver the right campaign. So this is where I talk about building your crowd. Now, when people think of the crowd, they think of people giving you money. And I argue against that quite strongly because... The crowd is people who support and know your campaign. Now, you've got friends and family here who will most likely give you money. And this also extends to your professional network. But we've got people like professional marketers who will just give out and share and create virality around um, your campaign in order to get that information and idea out there. This will then attract your external investors. People from your industry influences are people from your professional network who actively and uh, uh, consistently um, integrate and work with the, their networks from different industries. So you may get people, um, you, there's always people in your network that you know that 
Um, although you may be in marketing, they, they know people in construction, they know people in science, they know people in HR, and the people that they know listen to them and follow them around different um, events or different ideas or even articles. These are your industry influences, and what I've found is they're the most important people in getting traction to the wider public outside of your friends and family. So making sure that you at least capture a few of them to start sharing your campaign, start supporting your campaign, pays off dividends in the long run. Now, communication is king. Knowing how to talk to your crowd, knowing how to talk, um, knowing when to talk to your crowd, and knowing in what way your crowd communicates is vital. Um, just because you have a good story, you have a good core message, does not equal a great, um, great size of investment. Um, it's important to be transparent throughout your campaign. Um, as I said before, if you promise some, something and you do not communicate that throughout your campaign and you do not deliver at the end, there will be backlash. It will impact your reputation. Um, the best piece of advice I can give you in terms of the developing your communication channel as well as your platform um, step is put extra effort if you have the funds um, into your campaign video. It is the first point of call and acts as a marketing asset that you can share via your social media channels. It is the thing that um, most people see first when you're talking about your campaign, so it's good to put yourself in the best light possible. So. Um, yeah, so as I said, the communication of your crowd is essential, knowing what languages they use, what motivates them, what sophistication. Uh, are we talking about people who appreciate technical jargon or people who don't appreciate technical jargon? Um, people who use emotive language or clinical language or um, standardized language. All of this is important in ensuring that the right message keeps coming back and you're getting that donation momentum because people understand where you're coming from. Now, communication channels. Now, when I say communication channels, people automatically think social media. And I'll be honest, that is the most uh, prominent use of, uh, of crowdfunding being shared. Um, the problem with that is people get get the blinkers on and do not see outside of social media. So they start spending exorbitant amounts of money on developing a Facebook page and a Twitter page and an Instagram following and um, a YouTube channel and all and Pinterest and all the rest of it. Um, you need to understand and be clear that you, your, your social media development needs to be in line with how your crowd thinks. There's no point getting Instagram if um, your target markets are over the age of 50. Uh, because they're most likely going to be on Facebook or they're going to be on traditional media or radio. Um, there's no point getting onto printed newspaper if your target market are uh, millennials and tweens who don't read newspapers anymore. So you, you need to kind of pick your, so your communication channels based on your crowd. Now, spamming wastes everybody time. You need, uh, you need to be smart about who gets your information and how they're going to share it. Um, more often than not, people tend to think if I throw money at it, it'll work. Um, not true at all. Um, just because you boost a Facebook page, a, 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 a Facebook post, just because you share um, and pay money for your Twitter to get more followers, um, doesn't equate to people go then going to your um, campaign page, campaign platform, and then donating to your money. They may get more. Um, more people in front of it, which may equate, but in my experience, it doesn't correlate. So as I keep talk, harping on, and this is a crucial point, your ability to align your communication, your content, and your crowd with, with your central story of your campaign is the most important thing in order to ensure consistency. Now, don't let this slide um, overwhelm you. Um, from what, this is just a simple Google search. There are literally thousands of crowdfunding campaigns now out there, and each of them offer the same and slightly different just to um, differentiate themselves in the marketplace. Um, all of them operate on different models, um, so you can get a whole bunch of them to, that deliver on uh, donation, a whole bunch that deliver on reward-based, a whole bunch that deliver on lending, and even equity in a couple places in Europe and the, UK and the US. So the idea that um, you have to go with Kickstarter or Indiegogo, it really depends on what your strategy is for your platform. Um, are you going to leverage the, the whole 
branding of um, Kickstarter because it's the biggest. Uh, that that's up to you. Um, it it really comes down to how your strategy is. But if all you're using your crowdfunding uh, platform for is to a, a a basically a funnel to for people to give you money, just a channel uh, to give you money, you may need to look at the individual offerings of each uh, crowdfunding platform to see is this the one I want? Does this give me the, give me the best benefit? Um, and this idea that uh, if you go on blogs now, you see 10 successful steps of equity crowdfunding, uh, five steps, eight steps. There are certain things that you should be doing, but there's no one set method to guarantee you money. Um, crowdfunding, you need to be clear, you need to be consistent, but most, most importantly, you need to understand that your crowd is your crowd because you've created it. So. You're the best person to understand it and thus act upon what it's what it's telling you. Choosing the, the best platform, the best launch pad, um, is essential. You could go with the, 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 the generic and the, the largest, uh, Kickstarter or Indiegogo, um, because Kickstarter is all about tech. Um, Indiegogo is all about the emotional side of tech and product development. You could go with GoFundMe, who go, who's all about the idea of um, uh, donation-based, charity-based kind of campaigns. You've got Possible, which, which is a lot more of the startup scene. Chuffed, which is a non-profit. You're basically spoiled for choice. And you've really got to take a look back and look at your focus. Where will it get the most value? What is my strategy? And how am I going to execute? Now, if Possible, oh, sorry, if uh, Kickstarter is the biggest, and say, well, I'm going to leverage their ability and leverage their brand and say all, on all of my social media, now on Kickstarter, campaign, that's a very good strategy. That's utilizing their, the, the brand size to um, generate interest. John, but just to let I'm you know. I'm focusing more on Excuse me, John. Um, Sorry, your, audio, your audio is breaking up. A, a fair bit. Um, so oh, if you could just, uh -huh. uh, yeah, maybe keep your head straight uh, for for the microphone. That might help. It might it might go some way. I know that you're a very animated yeah. speaker. <laughs> apologies, apologies. Yeah. So um, the whole idea of picking and choosing your correct um, uh, crowdfunding platform is essential in in. in determining success and ultimately the results of your um, your target. Now the reward tiers, and I need to touch on this, um, make sure you can deliver on your reward tiers. A lot of people over promise without actually thinking about the, the, the true cost of what a reward tier means to their bottom line. Um, a lot of people, I, a lot of um, campaigns that I've worked with and have, have researched and studied, um, have a target of say ten thousand dollars and have a whole bunch of rewards saying we'll give you a hat, we'll give you our um, t-shirt with a branding on it, we'll give you pants. Um, at the end of the campaign, they end up spending nearly five thousand dollars first making the t-shirts, uh, hats, and pants, and then having that sent out to them. So, make big understanding as to what your what you're promising and that realistically okay the audio John is is very poor at the moment let's just see if it's a bandwidth issue let's see Okay, if you'd like to speak, John, and then we'll see if um, we'll find out if everybody can hear you. Okay, John, if you speak hello? and then we'll find can you hello. Hear me now? I can hear yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, can I just have a quick show of hands, everybody, if you're able to hear John clearly now? So, yes, okay, we seem to be back on board okay, with the audio. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Excellent. Apologies. 
Um, yeah, so making sure that clarity is consistent is one of the best ways you can ensure, at the very least, a, a successful uh, crowdfunding campaign. Um, so what they pretty, pretty much don't tell you when you do crowdfunding is the launch is the most critical point of your campaign. Ideally, you should be launching when your campaign has maximum engagement, market interest, social media activity, and feedback. Now, these are metrics that are kind of arbitrary, but you need to kind of establish some level of metrics around this to capture, to gauge an idea as to when you should be launching. So my engagement is, well, I'm getting 16 hits on my website, let's launch. Or I'm getting 40 on my website, let's launch. So having, a, having these metrics to determine when you should be launching is really important. Um, three to five days post campaign launch is the time in which most campaigns, and I say most with uh, air quotations, most campaigns receive the most donations uh, or rewards or, um, do, uh, or basically investment. Um, and it, therefore, it gives you an idea as to what you need to be doing next um, based on that response. So depending on the effectiveness of your preparation, this donation momentum, this ability to maintain a high level of people giving money to your campaign throughout the first stage of the campaign itself, um, will actually allow you to figure out, well, this is what I need to be doing. This is the contingencies I should be putting in place. Um, this is the communication I need to be putting out. Now, before you rush off, um, um, it's important to understand that you need to uh, first take a stock of what you are good at doing. Um, as I said before, um, I've had clients who, uh, who have done crowdfunding campaign, but have done it in a way that is outside of the quote unquote standard way of doing it. So I had, I worked with a couple of marketing guys who um, were delivering a crowdfunding campaign, but instead of building their social media, instead of building their online presence, they use their pre-existing resources and capabilities to talk to traditional media, to talk to bloggers, to, um, to develop their own marketing um, and digital uh, promotions and thus create attraction through the stuff that they were really good at and then leverage that to create social media pre presence and then transfer all of that following onto social media to get a more global response. And because they did that, they did what they were good at first, they were able to raise 20 grand in about four days. So before you start throwing money at stuff that you think you should be doing, throw money at stuff that you're good at and that you know you can deliver on and then fill in the gaps where need be. Um, once again, set realistic funding goals. Make sure that the, the crowd you're tapping um, has the, the amount of funds that, are, that marry up with the, the, the funding goal that you're looking to get. And like I said, preparation is the key. Once you have launched, it's very difficult to unpop the balloon. Um, and this is also something that isn't really talked about, but you need to be on the ball and involved and engaged with your own campaign three to four months prior to the campaign launch and at minimum three, three months post interacting with your investors, um, talking to uh, either delivering on promises of rewards or um, social investment through donations. And the most important thing is this is not some. This is not a static event. This is not something you post online and walk away from. This is something you have to nurture and grow in order for it to be successful and maintain that donation momentum. So, what does it all mean? Well, first and foremost, get help. Um, you, many people tend to crowdfund alone. It's not the ideal thing. If you can get help, if you can get support, if you get people to help you with this, take it. Teamwork matters. Now, crowdfunding requires a diverse set of skills. Some people can do it all, and if you can, more power to you. But a lot of the time, a lot of people are specialized in one aspect of the business, or two aspects. So it requires marketing, it requires financial management, communication, social media, multimedia and video production. I also throw in their team management, because dealing with people um, isn't always the easiest thing. So understanding PR as well is very important. So as I said, the campaign doesn't end when you get your cash. People have invested in you, and not only financially invested, but also emotionally invested as well. 
So a lot of the time when you people have got, go on to GoFundMe, you'll see stories of cancer treatment or um, I, I want to be funded so I can raise money for cancer. So I need this item or this bike or this piece of equipment. People give money to that and there's an ex expectation, even if it's not said, that I want to know what happens. Did you actually get the bike? Did you raise the money? Um, how is your cancer? Are you okay? Um, so they're emotionally invested in you. So you owe it to the people who've given you money to kind of feed that back to them and kind of build a, a customer base and a network around you. So it is important to find that balance of keeping costs down while acquiring those skills while maintaining that, um, that crowd expectation. Now, this is my second favorite slide um, because it touches on a really, really, really important point that no one, people seem to forget when dealing with funding in general, but crowdfunding specifically. Now, money is the result. And people say, yeah, it is. That, that's why we're crowdfunding. Yeah. There is no money waiting for you. You need to work for it. So it's the result and is the byproduct of your crowdfunding activity, preparation, and execution. So it kind of reworks your thinking a bit. Well, what do I need? How do I need to sell my product in order to get the money in the first place? How do I need to convince people to donate to me who do not know me, who do not know my product, and who haven't seen my product out in the marketplace or how it operates? So having a minimum funding target and aiming for that is important. It is better to get 50% of something and be able to boast about how you were successful, then get 100% of nothing, which is essentially saying it's better to get to ask for 10 grand and know you can get 10 grand and then tell everyone how successful you are about how you got your 10 grand and then leverage that for more investment because you're now validated by the market, then ask for 60 grand because that's how much you really need. And then go out to the crowdfunding uh, crowd who you know won't be able to give you that. And then come back and say, well, I wasn't successful. Crowdfunding didn't work. You need to be realistic and, and strategize effectively in order to gain and leverage what you have. Now, the internet is weird. And people always run about, oh, we need to get as viral as um, Hi uh, Hyperloop or SpaceX or the, the Beehive um, crowdfunding campaign. There is no way to predict or guarantee virality or people kind of supporting it for random reasons. This is the key example. Um, a gentleman on, I think it was Kickstarter, asked for $10 for um, uh, potato salad, um, to make potato salad. He got over $55,000 for, for potato salad because people just got behind the ludicrous idea of making potato salad and giving money to it. So as a result, the gentleman created a thing called Potato Salad Con, where he made a conference where he made potato salad and thanked everyone for helping him make potato salad. Uh, um, so there's no guarantee. So don't bet on your uh, campaign going viral. Bet on something you can execute. Bet, bet, uh, bet on your abilities and bet on your preparation and strategy. So just to summarize, um, know your crowd and platform. Uh, get your idea, your model your product, your service, before you start sharing it on the internet. Um, once again, money is the byproduct. Focus on the process. Um, communication is king. Keep your crowd engaged, and that includes your entire crowd, not just the people giving you money. Um, it starts at least four months before and at least three months after. Now, I didn't touch on this because I talked on it previously, but failing to achieve your funding target doesn't mean you wasted your time. Um, if you focus on the progress, you effectively undertaken a, a learning and packaging of your product service idea to a stage in which you can now go to investors, even if you fail and say, this is my market feedback. This is what I've done to change, improve my product. What do you think? So it actually takes an entrepreneurial approach to funding. Um, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've managed to glean some level of insight or uh, something useful from my inane ramblings of crowdfunding in my research. If I have any other questions, please, uh, I'd love to have a chat with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. And yes, you have stimulated quite a few questions coming through.
Um, so let's get the ball rolling with those. Um, for starters, um, Clinton has a question relating to IP. So for IP reasons, does it make more sense to hold off from a crowdfunding campaign until you have a working prototype or early sales, for example? Yeah, um, that's a very good question. Um, it depends on what you're trying to crowdfund. Now, if you're talking about a product, then uh, have crowdfunded the product. It's in order to market it, people get tend to get behind prototypes a lot more because it's something tangible, something physical that they can see. Um, if at the very least you can create up a digital three-dimensional mock-up of it, um, I know there's a couple of guys who crowdfunded a pair of Sunnies. Um, they didn't have the, they were crowdfunding so they could make it, but they were able to get a couple of uh, digital artists to make a 3D rendering of it. Um, so people know what they're paying for. Um, whether or not you, you're holding off on a IP protection or proto prototype, prototypes uh, are just sexy in the sense of they, they can, it allows the, um, the uh, donator to have an idea of what they can, putting their, putting their money towards. Um, in, in order of protecting it, um, I would recommend that you don't put all of the bells and whistles online. Um, a lot of the time, uh, people are a bit secretive, and, and rightly so, and people need to get smarter about that. So in terms of whether or not you should post up um, or you should hold off, it really comes down to how easily replicable is your IP and make a judgment call based on that. Now, if it, if it is really easily uh, um, uh, replicated, then I would, um, just because that uh, then you're effectively sharing your idea with the entire world and a really good engineer or um, design specialist can just reverse engineer it. I hope that answered your question. Looks like it did. Thank you very much, John. Uh, Makara is asking uh, a couple of questions here. One is, mm -hmm. um, from launching campaigns on crowdfunding sites, what's your number one do and number one don't from the experience? <laughs> um, okay, number one don't, and I, there's a lot of don'ts um, just because of my experience because I failed a lot of times. Um, the number one. Okay, John, we're losing you again. Yep, is it better now? Yes. Okay. Do not jump in too early. Um, uh, I think we might have lost you again. A balloon? Yeah, it's very broken up. Okay. Um, it's important to ensure that Is that better? Uh, wasn't, but it is now. Okay. Um, uh, so yeah, don't, don't jump in too early. My number one do is get your campaign video really, really important. Okay, we've lost you again. Um, all done. So I'm just... That's it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so another question from Makara. Um, which of all the different crowdfunding sites would you say is best targeted for social enterprises or, or businesses focused on creating social value? Okay, I'm not sure the, um, if John's speaking. Um, in the chat? So you're thinking you might type your answers in the chat? Yeah, yeah no, I'll try, type my answers in the chat, that might help. So everybody, if you just like to look in your control panel down the bottom, you'll see a, a bar for chat and 
because we are having some audio difficulties, John is going to type his responses to the questions there. So I think Okay. Okay, nothing coming through just yet. Apologise for these audio difficulties. Okay, so for those of you who can hear um, and haven't yet found the chat room there, John's response to that query about um, social value businesses or social enterprises, um, look for ones that have established a an, not-for-profit tax exemption option and that's great for an established not-for-profit organisation. Okay. Um, do we have any other questions that are coming through about today's webinar? Uh, a question from Michelle, is the, um, mm -hmm. is the, is the, okay, so is, is the crowdfunding industry regulated? Um, the short answer is yes, the long answer is not really. It is managed by the um, the Australian one at the very least by the AI, A, A, AIC. Uh, ASIC. I should. Yeah, I think it's typing time again, John. Okay. And just also uh, another answer that John gave. Um, in response to the crowdfunding websites, he mentioned chuffed.org, C-H-U-F-F-E-D.org is another site for social value, social enterprises and businesses seeking to deliver social value. Okay, so just going through with, so ASIC um, manages the regulations associated with investments. Okay, but I, I suspect that being reaching a global audience, it may not be possible to regulate or to have um, confidence in a lot of international, internationally based crowdfunding platforms. Would that be correct, John? So just looking at John's typing here. So ASIC has been managing the regulations associated with investments since the update to the equity crowdfunding space. Those regulations have been coming through. Right, and yes, a bit difficult to regulate those based overseas. Um, I, think, I think the problem that we have at the moment with um, with the audio. Okay, one more question I've got here from Vic. In your opinion, is it likely to damage a brand reputation to start a crowdfunding campaign? Um, could you damage a brand reputation with a crowdfunding campaign? Absolutely, says John, uh, and also as part of Vic's question there is, um, you know, it, uh, John's response is absolutely, particularly if you over-promise and under-deliver, um, I think Vic's concerns too are that the campaign might be providing a better product and if you're campaigning to raise funds to develop a better product, you might be highlighting the flaws in a current product. So do you think there are risks involved with a campaign for a new product um, risking the brand reputation of a current product? It's 
So John's madly typing away. Okay, John has confirmed that it's very true that you can take some very real risks and you need to consider those when you're developing your communication, when you're putting out your messages about your campaign, putting out your messages about the new product. Um, and, uh, and that's why he has emphasised communication and said it's so important. Okay, so that looks like the end of our run of questions, John. Um, I think we might wrap it up there. We are coming up for time. Just a reminder to everybody to download your handouts because you will get a copy of John's slides in that case. Um, and if for any reason you are unable to download the handouts right now, all you need to do is to send an email request to info at impactinnovationgroup.com and those slides can be sent to you. But um, it may be a little while before we get back to those sending out those emails because we have so many webinars that we're working on this week. So please tune in again tomorrow. I've not noted that a number of people have said they will be. So our webinar tomorrow is with Megan Taylor and she will be talking about marketing strategies and Megan's a social media marketing strategist. Uh, so tune in for that one same time, but uh, you will need to get a new login, so make sure you register for that. Thanks again everybody for uh, participating. We'll have one last attempt to connect with John via his microphone. Any last words, John? No, it looks like that's it for John's audio. Thank you everybody and uh, we'll see you online very soon. Bye for now.